by plate man Mike Wilner. Mike, it's great to have you here in Texas. Uh, a lot of hype around uh, a very young Blue Jays team. A lot of more recent hype with Vlad Jr. here. What has it been like past 10 days, past seven days here with Vladdy, with the hype? What are your thoughts on just what's going on with Jays right now? I mean, it's been insane. It really has the, the attention that he's been getting. Uh, the the amount of people who just want a piece of Vladimir Guerrero Jr. all the time, right? He got called up, he made his debut in Toronto, and there was a massive media thing. And, and then the first road trip, which we're on right now, first stop is in Anaheim, where his father played, and, you know, Vlad Sr. is going to the Hall of Fame with an angel cap. And, and so there was a massive media thing. Now we're here in Texas, where Vlad Sr. played as well, and, and another massive media thing on the first day. Uh, I literally, I've been covering this game for 30 years I have never seen anything like the amount of attention that Vladimir Guerrero Jr. has gotten. Just bigger than Bryce, bigger than A-Rod? Absolutely. At the beginnings of their careers, yeah, I mean Bryce Harper was on the cover of Sports Illustrated with the word Cooperstown on it when he was 16, so that's a little different, but just the amount of people surrounding him, it, it was like a playoff game, the, the first game that, that Vlad played. And Yeah, I, I captured a video yesterday Texas, there were fans uh, jumping on top of the dugout or underneath the, the meshing just to try and get a chance at an autograph. I've never seen it before. It's unbelievable. <laughs> so, as, as well, it seems like, I talked with um, Pat Tablet a little bit about it, it seems like pitchers may be trying to, maybe they see that you might, they're, they're, they're pitching them you know, away or, or outside of the strike zone, maybe to see if we'll get himself out. Is, is that kind of what you're seeing so far? Yeah, I mean, they're trying to use his aggressiveness against him, and, and you saw that the first time he came up with runners on base. Like, his first game, every time he either let off an inning or came up with nobody on every time, and then in his second game, his first at-bat was bases loaded, nobody out, and you could tell that he was really, you know, a... a excited about the situation, wanted to drive in a run, wants to make a big splash, wants to help his team win, right? So, um, he... He sort of expanded a little bit more than we're used to seeing. But I think the issue more for him has been he'll take a pitch that he thinks is a ball and it's called a strike. And when you look back in the, the strike box or the K zone or whatever, it was a ball. He's right. It wasn't a strike. But because it was called a strike, now all of a sudden he thinks, okay, well, maybe this isn't going to be called a ball either, and so I'm going to have to do that. So when, when he gets those kinds of pitches, Ball's called strikes, then you'll see him open up. Otherwise, there's only been a couple of occasions where he's really expanded the zone. And um, also, it, it seems like it's a little bit of an interesting time for Blue Jays baseball as well. Um, I want to ask you this question. Do you feel it's possible to retool and win at the same time? You know, we've seen it, uh, I think we've seen it this year in the NBA with the Clippers. We've seen it with the Oakland A's in the past. Do you, do you think it's, it's and do you think that's where the Jays are, that they could potentially re retool, rebuild, and win at the same time? I think it's possible. I think the Yankees did it a couple of years ago, right? They got to the wild card game. Um, but uh, that's not what this team's trying to do. This team is going not quite scorched earth, but pretty close. And we'll see as the season progresses if they trade Marcus Stroman and Aaron Sanchez and Ken Giles and, and on and on and on, Justin Smoke. Um, they're not expecting to win. I think if things break right, they can because mostly because the rest of the American League is so terrible that there's an opening for that second wild card. So if they keep Stroman and Sanchez and Giles and, and they keep getting good contributions from Trent Thornton and Clay Buckholtz and Ryan Barucki comes back and, and, you know, Kevin Biggio comes up and Lourdes Gurriel and all this stuff and Vlad hits a stride, they could be a 500 team and a little bit better and that might be all you need to be in the playoffs in the American League this year. But I don't think that's the plan for them. I don't think that's the expectation for them. I think they're looking to rebuild, and the competitive window will open in a couple of years. And, um, I mean, you watch, you watch more Blue Jays baseball than literally anyone. Is, is, um, is, that, is that tough for those? Do you think it's tough for Sanchez and Strowman? Because those guys, a couple of years ago, those guys were like, you know, these guys are the mainstays of the franchise. Well, and they still are, right? Yeah. But but they haven't been healthy and that's been the problem and now Stroman's healthy and he's been unbelievable Sanchez for the most part has been healthy and he's been very very good uh, and the problem is that they don't line up they're free agents after next year where this team is probably just gonna start its ascent that late that year so 
you know, you wonder, are they better off dealing them and bringing in more kids Vlad's age, or are they better off extending them? I think they're better off extending them because I think if you trade Stroman and Sanchez, you spend the next three or four years looking for the next Stroman and Sanchez, which is very difficult to find. It's hard to find pitching, right? Right. Um, I guess uh, one other thing I wanted to ask you as well, because Jose Batista is very infamous in this community and uh, legendary in the city of Toronto. Um, do you feel, um, were you surprised at all that after he left the Jays, just how quickly it kind of went away as far as you know him his options? Well, I think they were they were declining when he came back to the Jays that first time, right? Yeah. He went out as a free agent expecting to get this big deal, and nobody called, and so he wound up coming back to the Blue Jays. And, and there was, it, I mean, he said there were other offers and multi-year offers. I'm not so sure that they were any, uh, you know, any good. Um, but then last year, he kicked around on three different teams, and nobody wanted him at the beginning. And and it's because the 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 skill set went away really really quickly. He still got the great eye at the plate, but we saw towards the end of his Blue Jays tenure, he was having trouble catching up to fastballs. He was cheating a little, which made him strike out a lot more. He wasn't the guy he was even as recently as 2016. And baseball as a whole has moved away from guys over 30, never mind over 35. So th that's the big problem with Jose Bautista. For sure. Is um I guess the last one for you is is um. You, you, you also did Blue Jays Talk, uh, which is a uh, radio show and a uh, post show in Toronto for 20-plus uh, years? 17 years. 17 years. And um, obviously a dream come true, I'm sure, to be calling games for the Blue Jays. What has, what has this been like for you, this, this kind of transition? And... Um, how was, how was the experience with it's been amazing. It's been a long transition. I started uh, Blue Jays Talk in 2002. I started calling play-by-play -play on a regular basis in 2013 and gradually have moved up into the part of the team permanent travel, 162 games just this year, and it's, it's incredible. You know, the, the Blue Jays broadcast is sort of a, a sacred place Tom Cheek was the first lead broadcaster for the Blue Jays, and he did the first 4,000-plus games in a row. Never had a day off between April 7th, 77, when the franchise started, until 2004, when his father died, and he took a day off. And um, unfortunately, he was gone two years later. He had brain cancer, um, and, and he was, he's the standard, right? He's in the Hall of Fame in Canada and in the United States. Um, and he worked with Jerry Howard from 1982 all the way till... 2017 when Jerry finally hung him up uh, and it's been me and Ben Wagner pretty much ever since and so you know you're talking about a broadcast that in the 43 years of this franchise has had like five play-by-play -play guys right and 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 three leads and and two teams and that's it so it's a, it's an amazing thing to be a part of this huge history um, to, to be, you know, especially to be a hometown kid, being able to do it. How many people get to be the broadcaster for the team they grew up watching? Almost nobody. And, and no, of course not, you know. And I'm the first Canadian to, to be able, you know, to do this on the radio as a, as a regular play-by-play -play guy. Never mind the Toronto-born. Um, it's... it's it's unfathomable, really, and it's just been really uh, an incredible thing to, to be able to be a part of. All right.